I'm Kristen Anderson. I'm the branch manager of Ashland Library, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. And we thought that it would be fun to start doing some videos where we talked about books. So I just posted a blog post about what my favorite books were from the year, because this is the time of year when that sort of thing happens. But you may have also noticed that on social media, we often talk about books. We, well, we, we talk about books every Friday. And so I brought the December slate of books that we talked about, but I also brought some books that I thought were just good reads from the year. And I figured I'd also plug my blog post, which just went live. Um, and that one is, you can find it at jcls.org slash blog. And it is about best books of the year, but also like some of the crazy animal stories that we've seen this year, like murder hornets and zombie mink and things like that. So if you want to learn more about those things, go visit that blog post and some of our book lists. Um, but let's talk about our Friday reads. Um, every Friday, um, we post a picture of a book and invite people to share with us what they're reading as well. And in December, we talked about um, The Loop by Jeremy Robert Johnson and The Power by Naomi Alderman and The Deaths of the Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle by Stuart Turton and The Ready Made Thief by Augustus Rose. And as I was sitting thinking about what I might talk about today, I kind of started thinking about how those books kind of related to each other. And we've got kind of some genre bending um, content in all of those novels. Um, the Power is about women developing kind of superpowers that allows them to basically take over the world and um, kind of deals with the corrupting influence of power. Um, so it's, it's kind of a sci-fi that makes you think. Um, the Loop has those elements as well. Um, the Seven and a Half Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle is about a murder, but you see it over and over and over again from a, this, the same consciousness placed in different point of views, characters, heads. Basically, it's really complicated to explain, and you would need to probably pick it up and try reading it to fully understand what I'm trying to say about it. But it's another one that's going to mess with your head a little bit, as is The Ready-Made Thief, which has been called a, um, it's, been, it's been likened to the Da Vinci Code, but it's also been um, promoted for fans of, um, of uh, Mr. Penumbra's 24-hour bookshop as well. Um, and all of those books are worth reading. If you don't know how or we pick or why we pick the particular books we do for the Friday Reads, those are all books that, at the point that we post them, are available in the library right now. So you're not going to find the books that just came out on Tuesday, which is the day of the week when all books are published. Fun fact. but. <coughs> They are books that have done their cycle of um, holds and are now available for you to check out, which makes it easier because sometimes our hold lists can be awfully long for the new and more popular titles, which is what I'm going to shift to now because I brought some of my favorite reads from this year and many of them did end up having hold lists when I looked at them. Um, so, um, the books, there were, there were like three categories of books that were some of my very favorites of this year. And around Halloween, I found myself in a place where I was, re I found, I was reading in sequence two books set in Salem that had witchcraft themes, which was really super cool to read around Halloween. Um, but it doesn't matter what time of year that you read them. These are both wonderful books. The first one is called The Once and Future Witches by Alex Harrow. And that one is set in the late 1800s. It is set in a town called New Salem, which is not a town that exists in our world. But this is a, oh man, I'm going to just go off the rails and getting too detailed into this. Okay. 
The Once and Future Witches by Alex Harrow, which is set in the late 1800s in a town called New Salem. And it's a world where witchcraft exists, um, but it's kind of been lost and hidden to history because we've essentially forgotten our witchcraft. And um, it's been hidden in plain sight in things that are considered feminine or girly. So nursery rhymes, um, songs, things like that that are not considered important um, to um, the, the, char the character's male counterparts. So in The Once and Future Witches kind of happens at that time when the feminist movement is kind of getting, the suffragist movement is getting up and going. And what's fascinating about this book is that, you know, the historical setting is wonderful. The world building of the magic is wonderful, but it is also a book that acknowledges and interacts with and thinks about the, um, the fact that the feminist movement of this time, historically speaking, was very centered on white women. And this book has interesting and unique representation of um, characters of color, of how magic might um, be accessed differently based on cultural background, and also has some wonderful and unique examples of LGBTQ plus representation. So, um, and it was just a really enjoyable read. And right at the same time, I read a book called We Ride, on, upon, we Ride upon Sticks by Quan Berry. This one set about 100 years later, 1989. Um, so for me, it was like a joy to read because this was exactly when I was in high school. We Ride Upon Sticks is a, um, essentially a crucible retelling. It is, um, it, is, it is also set in, kind of in, in New England. The field hockey team, the 1989 high school field hockey team in this town, uh, essentially makes a pact with the devil, essentially. And um, they all become a coven of witches and they end up playing really, really well. They've always been kind of a bad news bears, not very successful team. And um, the, through this crucible retelling and the points of view of all of these different characters, which again has like amazing representation um, across um, you know, racial and ethnic um, lines as well as LGBTQIA plus lines and um, just both of these books were really fantastic and it was kind of, it was very very neat to read them together um i also um think for me this year has been one about reading about um race and racism and how those things are how our world interacts with those things. And so two of my favorite nonfiction reads this year were a book called Cast, The Origin of Our Discontents by Isabel Wilkerson, and also Hood Feminism, Notes from the Women That a Movement Forgot by Mickey Kendall. Cast is a historical look at um, the caste system in India and draws lines from that to the structure, the informal structure of how race is perceived and seen in the United States. And then has this extra kind of layer where it looks at um, how some of those policy decisions that were made early in the history of the United States informed policy decisions that were made in Nazi Germany. Um, it's wonderful. The one thing I usually say when I'm telling people about it is that it does need a little bit of a trigger warning because there are some very graphic depictions of lynchings in them. So if that is something that would harm you, I would encourage people to perhaps get to those scenes and then um, maybe skim over them and not actually interact with them because they're pretty intense. Um, hood feminism deals with how um, issues related to uh, that, that, that poverty and race are a part of conversations related to feminism and how they're often ignored. Again, now we're back 
kind of in the conversation we were having earlier about um, uh, the once and future witches where early feminism largely ignored um, issues related to race and racism and this is an extension of that into our present day and it is eye-opening and worth reading. Finally, I wanted to talk about two books that I read this year that were historical and also um, deal, with <laughs> deal with pandemics. Um, so the, these may not be everyone's cup of tea this year, but The Pull of the Stars by Emma Donoghue was raced to publication in the fall because it deals with the 1918 flu pandemic. It's wonderful. She's got a really good lyrical prose style. It's set in the flu slash maternity ward in an Irish hospital over the course of a very short period in, uh, in 1918 and is just a really good, compelling read. And then for those of us who have kind of a Shakespeare interest, there's also Hamnet, that's H-A-M-N-E-T by Maggie O'Farrell. And that is a story of William Shakespeare's home life. So it's a novel about William Shakespeare in which his name is never mentioned, except I'm sure on the flat copy and in the author's afterward. He's referred to as the playwright, the father, the son, the husband, but never by name. It's really about his family. Shakespeare had a son named Hamnet, and Hamnet died of unknown causes at the age of 11. In this book, he dies of plague, and the entire book is set up as kind of the love story of, um, of Shakespeare. And in this, his wife is referred to as Agnes, but um, we usually call her Anne Hathaway. Um, and it's about their falling in love and they're getting married and they're having a family together and him not being there and then the trauma of their son dying and how they process and draws a line or makes some interesting assumptions about what that might, why, why then the play Hamlet might have had that name based on that information. Um, so all of those are really great books that came out either this year or close to this year and are really worth checking out. And I hope that you will engage with us on our blog and um, through our JCLS Discovery um, service, which allows us to kind of do some reader's advisory for you and pick some books out for you and continue to kind of keep track of our, our Friday reads. Thanks. <laughs>